All right, higher side chatters, by now we know damn well that only a privileged, nefarious few truly make the big decisions of the world. A powerful network made up of royal bloodlines, secret societies, occult orders, shady banksters, and corporate oligarchs some call the Illuminati. And we've spent a lot of time tracing their influence back through history and identifying the strings attached to major world events they'd much rather have us believe were random, but what if we could get some insight into their plan going forward? Well, today we have a guest who is very serious about his claims to be an Illuminati defector. His name is Leo Zagami, and he was a 33rd degree Freemason, a high-ranking member of the P2 Lodge, and born from a lineage of aristocratic Illuminati blood. But after years of grooming by the powers that be, in 2006 he walked away from participation in many of these secret alliances and started exposing their members as well as their agendas. He's written several bestsellers in several languages along the way, including Pope Francis, The Last Pope, Money, Masons, and Occultism in the Decline of the Catholic Church, Confessions of Illuminati Volume 1, The Whole Truth About the Illuminati and the New World Order, and of course his latest that we're going to focus on today, Confessions of an Illuminati Volume 2, The Time of Revelation and Tribulation Leading Up to 2020. It's going to be a wild ride and I'm sure we'll learn a lot. Leo, my man, welcome to the higher side. Hello everybody at the higher side the chats and thank you for having me on today. Yeah, man, it is a real honor. And, uh, you know, so right off the bat, I guess we need to break down your story for newcomers a little bit. How do you define the Illuminati and talk to us a bit about your history with them? Okay, uh, my history with the, what you define as the New World Order, more than the Illuminati. The Illuminati is uh, actually a subject which I go in depth uh, in, three, in three volumes, where I define, first of all, what is this term Illuminati? And it's not really a single order as one, uh, and a single conspiracy as one wants to believe. It's something different. It's something very different here. Uh, we are talking about a fragmented group of secret societies that uh, work following prophecies. And at one point in time, and this point of time is now, they actually unify their intentions and work together for the dawn of a new era. Um, so there's a network really of secret societies I define as the Illuminati. So not only the Adam Weishaupt order founded in 1776 that many people know. That one actually had a brief duration. But because I, for the first time, take the subject under a uh, academic perspective, giving uh, proper uh, links to credible sources, uh, um, showing also documents, uh, inside documents. I want to be realistic with what these Illuminati actually are. And some of them uh, are more illuminated than others. Uh, of course, the one that prevails are the ones we, we, we all focus on as the Illuminati, and they are the dark side uh, in reality, of this uh, fraternity, uh, which works uh, to uh, manipulate this uh, end time scenario. And uh, I have described it uh, very well in volume two, because in volume two, it's uh, not only while well, in volume one, I um, wanted people to figure out uh, who were the protagonists of this uh, story. Um, in volume two, we really go into the depth of this story. And so we actually uh, approach uh, uh, more than now, what's going on now in the world. And uh, I think that you have maybe appreciated that of my book. Um, I hope so, at least. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I still do want to get into your involvement in the Illuminati. Your bio says this is something you were born into. Can you elaborate on your connection? Yes, uh, I, what I describe as a bio, and actually I must say, volume two, uh, for all those people who really want to know my background, also family background, and of course always from credible and reliable sources, um, have a bio that is unprecedented in the other books, because uh, yes, you have, of course, uh, a lot uh, written about me on the internet, but uh, you must know that uh, probably a lot of it is also disinformation planted by the enemy, and, and, and so during the course uh, of the last uh, few years, since 2008, I actually focused on writing books where I can bring together uh, this material and not risk uh, that the whole thing will blow up at one point or the other, because um, between 2006 and 2008, when I first came out on the internet with my revelations, I was attacked. I was accused of espionage. My websites were brought down. I was arrested. I didn't want this to happen any longer. I just wanted people 
to at that point have the book in their hands and at that point when the book is in their hands it's too late for the system to really stop it so uh, there is a lot of work behind bringing this book uh, to the people i mean i have to thank uh, in america my publisher who is uh, brad olsen at ccc publishing who had to himself get into um, you know a lot of pressure from even these secret societies that are in the u.s and are part of this illuminati network that, of course, didn't want my book to be released. One of them, in, in particular, the Ordo Tempi Orientis. But uh, in, in, in this book, also volume two, I speak about Satanism and its connection with Hollywood and its connection with modern Satanism, uh, which is also very important to understand uh, how they are working out this uh, before underground cult, but bringing it overground and making Satanism accepted at a um, normal level. And I know this is very sad to hear this kind of thing, but unfortunately now uh, with this uh, new kind of Satanism in the U.S., uh, we, we even have political lobbying, uh, more wide acceptance, uh, buildings, great statues like the one in Detroit. Uh, and the whole thing is to make Satanism more and more acceptable because, of course, Satanism is part of this new world order. And, and at the same time, we have, instead the Catholic faith, which is part of accepting and putting into a sort of synchronicity all the various religions of the world to mold together something that will become the one world religion. So there is a lot to say about volume two is also one of probably one of my longest books in the sense that it's a um, very consistent number of pages, nearly 400. So there is a lot to read and for you, a lot to ask me about it. <laughs> yeah, man, it is clear that you know a lot and kind of like what you've alluded to. I know the critics are going to say there are no real whistleblowers from the elite, only infiltrators. That's what critics say. What would you say to win those people over? Oh, absolutely. In volume two, you can finally, uh, I mean, I've already released, as you know, uh, volume one and uh, Pope uh, Francis de la Pope. But Pope Francis de la Pope is more of um, uh, an investigative uh, journalism uh, work uh, on the Vatican, of course, also with my inside sources. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, there's very little of my, uh, you know, personal as much as in confessions, because confessions is really where we go into the subject of secret societies, where in one way or another, and Freemasonry, I have been a protagonist. Now, I came from a family um, of uh, the aristocracy in Sicily that married into the aristocracy in Scotland, um, but uh, English uh, aristocracy mixed into it. Uh, all this uh, created uh, who I am now. Now, if I describe it like this, it doesn't sound very credible. If you instead go and read volume two, as you probably have done yourself, mm -hmm. you have noticed that there is actually uh, a chapter, chapter six, uh, and where uh, the first subchapter of this chapter six, which is entitled My Experience in the New World Order and My War Against Satanism and Disinformation, is entitled My Family. Because uh, with uh, this uh, uh, subchapter, My Family, I really wanted to give the details about my family, the names, the people. You can't make these things up. I'm sorry. If you make these things up in Europe, you get arrested. Okay? So you can't make them up. There is rules. There is regulations. You can't claim to be the son of Rockefeller if you're not. Uh, and, and, and so in the end, you will always uh, get busted. I am a credible source because I am recognized as such because of my family. My grandfather was a senator. I participated to the Italian political scene myself, uh, apart from writing and publishing 18 books worldwide. Um, I've uh, participated actively to Freemasonry and nowadays have my own order, which is the Ordo Illuminatorum Universalis, which I am Grand Master of, which is very active in Italy. Uh, we have uh, now more than one lodge and uh, we are operating against the evil forces, but staying underground because to make the kind of disclosure that I am making, you are basically fighting a war here. And to fight this war, you have to, to make, uh, make it impossible for the enemy to attack you. As I have been attacked in the past, arrested, persecuted, and whatnot, I have decided to uh, reawaken in 2012 uh, in a more uh, um, visible level my original secret society, which uh, I had established, uh, co-established in 1999 in Monte Carlo. There was a meeting after, and this, all this stuff you can find on the internet if you go through the years. It's not like Lil Zagami just popped up today. Mm -hmm. um, and in Italy, there is uh, various newspapers 
that have talked about uh, my work with Freemasonry in the Monte Carlo Lodge with certain people. Um, and these newspapers are at a national level. Also, my involvement with the Batilix affair, uh, so the latest Batilix uh, two scandal in the Vatican. Um, and, and this is a matter of not so many months ago, and it will be actually featured in uh, uh, my next book, Volume 3. Because uh, also what people need to understand is that uh, the more I move on and the more things happen, I just uh, try to update the versions of the confessions. So the original confessions that came out uh, in 2012-2013 have uh, now been updated and they will be continuously updated because uh, is the first work of what I define as conspiracy reality. This is not a conspiracy, but it's the reality. And it's a conspiracy reality. It's uh, like people want uh, today to live uh, this kind of reality show situation, no? Uh, and they want to think it's cool to live in this kind of reality show situation, but even if their life is pretty pathetic or boring. I try to actually bring out of the closet a very interesting scenario. It might be very dangerous. It is very dangerous. But because I'm not alone, and people know that in Italy, where I have an official order registered by law, because in Italy, after the P2 scandal, we had to comply to certain rules by the state. So my association and order are registered. They have uh, an address. They have even a fiscal uh, tax number. And it's uh, based in Florence. So we try to do this work uh, uh, quite in the open. I also carry on this uh, very Christian form of Freemasonry, which is called the Strict Templar Observance. People who actually know my work at that level, of course, uh, Freemason of high level, they know that I'm very serious. I was received not so long ago in, uh, in France uh, at a uh, very important uh, Grand Lodge uh, uh, headquarters and, and, and of one of the most popular uh, Grand Lodges uh, in France. And, and this, I'm doing this uh, and actually trying to now bring back, uh, you see, I came out with my revelation in 2006 because I actually had a clash with the Monte Carlo Lodge, as, as you described uh, in uh, your introduction to my person. OK, since then, things have evolved a lot. Mm -hmm. The actual order that I had created in, in Monte Carlo, the Order Universalis in 1999, in 2008, uh, after a conference that took place in Nice, was brought back to Italy with a decision by the majority of the members that I could actually take it away from Monte Carlo and from the New World Order. At that point, I had the possibility of using my archives and at the same time all the spies I have in all the lodges worldwide to work this disclosure without uh, uh, being touched too much because I am not alone. People know in Italy that I have lodges. That means that my information is then spread through my lodges. And if I get killed, there is others that will come immediately after in my name and have all my material. So, the, 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 but also the, the, the actual aim of the Ordi Luminatorum Universalis uh, that was to bring this disclosure in this end time scenario from the beginning, even when we founded it in 1999, this was the original aim. And I think it gets described through the books that you have been reading. I mean, you, you yourself saw how and when I cite certain things, I always give credible references, name, places, and dates. This is not about just speculation. That will be, I want to make a work of history here. They used to call me the historian in the Monte Carlo Lodge, and that's what I do. Hmm. Yeah, man, it is very dense and well-sourced, and... What I would say to skeptics is that this latest book is about the New World Order plan between now and 2020. We can definitely hear you out and in the next four years. We'll know just how accurate you really were. So maybe talk to us about some of the major plans that we should be concerned with coming up. Well, um, we have, first of all, uh, I start uh, with an anticipation or what will be also a subject that I will go into again in volume three, which is the building of Solomon's Temple. And uh, this uh, subject is very important because, uh, as you know, it coincides also with uh, uh, certain teachings within Freemasonry and, uh, of course, in certain rites of Freemasonry, like the Royal Arch in particular. And also, for the first time, and this actually comes to my mind now because a few weeks ago, it was actually on the day of the Brexit, I received a mail from a Mason from the United Grand Lodge of England, and he told me, Leo, I have to really thank you very much because for the first time, 
I, uh, for a very long time, have been part of the Rastafarian movement, and uh, people in the Rastafarian movement don't really know their origins, their Masonic origins, and I'm not saying they are negative. I'm saying simply they don't know them. And uh, this, uh, fa the fact that you have talked about the ancient mystic order of Ethiopia that derived from uh, what is uh, Prince Hall Freemasonry, which is a Freemasonry founded uh, uh, in the U.S. by black Americans who were free slaves and could uh, uh, aspire to become free Masons because the word Freemason means being a free man. So I have actually uh, tried to also bring out this element about the uh, Haile Selassie holy bloodline, which is very important also for at an Illuminati level. I mean, uh, I have pictures of Haile Selassie with the Grand Masters of the Vatican and the Grand Master of certain orders, knighthood orders. Uh, he, he, uh, but not only that, uh, there is a lot more material, as you know, in Volume 2, and I don't want to confuse too much people. Uh, another thing, maybe if we want to, because, of course, it's very difficult to describe in two hours, 400 pages. I can say that another important element in this book is the rise of the dragon, meaning China. Um, Chinese Freemasonry is a very important element, which I discuss uh, which has never been discussed really before and made in, in, you know, in their links with the Illuminati and the whole Masonic network worldwide, this mafia and crime syndicate that uh, some of these lodges are connected to, uh, Macau, for example, which, as we know, is a, uh, not only a paradise for, uh, for, for the criminals, but also for, for, for great games, uh, gaming like uh, you have in Las Vegas. Uh, and, and, and this is connected, though, with uh, somebody who is very important in Las Vegas and uh, who I talk about in this book. Now, I don't want to, of course, spoil everything for the reader, but I can say that uh, we have also a connection between the drug trade and the skull and bones at Yale University uh, and the Chinese triads. Um, I describe uh, what is the actual um, roots of the Manchurian candidate, meaning uh, the actual uh, etymology, where it comes from, where they picked up this idea. And they actually picked it up from the adventures of Fu Manchu. Hmm. And, 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 and from a very old, uh, um, as you know, Fu Manchu was very popular in, uh, in, uh, in the U.S. until the Chinese U.S. lobby prohibited uh, these kind of movies because they seem uh, uh, offensive towards the Chinese. In their, their, but uh, at the time, uh, or in 1936, uh, uh, there was a movie, um, uh, actually a book uh, published in 1936 called President Fu Manchu. Uh, and, and in this book, uh, there is a gangster who is drugged and hypnotized into committing murder at a given signal. That is the beginning of the Manchurian candidate. We are talking about 1936. Um, but I wanted to also link all this with the Illuminati network. And I think that uh, yourself have, have seen how a detailed uh, kind of information I'm trying to give here. And also about some of the good people in this tradition, because I talk also about uh, an ex-criminal like Raymond Cho, who is very popular in, uh, in, in, in the U.S. and in the triad scenario. So here we're not just, you know, giving some kind of uh, conspiracy theory with uh, no specifics about the, the whole plot. The plot is here in front of your eyes, and it includes the Georgia Guidestones. It includes the fact that humanity wants, um, it will be brought down by this elite who has a plan. Mm -hmm. And this plan is also part of this serpentine path, which they are following secretly. So any questions that you might want to ask me that, uh, because uh, like this, I can have an idea of what you are, might be more interested for your listeners. Absolutely. And it is dense and spreads through a whole lot of different categories in history. But I want to uh, talk about the power pyramid a little bit. To quote the book, you say, as I have myself verified since childhood, at the top of the pyramid resides the bloodlines of the elite where there is a strange kind of bond between the English nobility and the Jews. This suggests that a bloodline relationship exists between the British royals and the Israelis. I find that really interesting. There also seems to be yeah. a German component as well somewhere in there. Yeah. But can you talk about those uh, connections and the power pyramid and ethnicity? 
Oh, well, very interesting because, of course, uh, when you actually come from uh, these bloodlines and you actually view it uh, in your daily life, uh, it becomes quite, uh, you know, obvious. Uh, I can say myself, I'm not, uh, you know, I, I, I tend to uh, these days not mingle with some of my family friends because of this reason, because it, I tend to become a little bit controversial in their presence. You can imagine if, you know, you are mingling with people where you have a Jewish mix, uh, where the one guy is the best friend of Prince Charles, the other one is a, a royalty, the other one is a descendant of a Jewish prophet. But the thing is that there is a very strong link. And so I wanted to describe in volume two also this link um, based also on what was said by a specific secret society which uh, uh, made this manifesto not so long ago is a new, uh, let's say, a, a new uh, movement of Rosicrucians. They appeared in 2007. Uh, they actually are part, though, of a very old movement of Rosicrucians present in, in, in British Freemasonry, which is the Società Rosicruciana in Anglia. Now, this, uh, this manifesto, which I also mentioned uh, and I outlined in volume one, I talk about it also in volume, uh, in volume two, because it's very important that people understand that within the elite of Freemasonry, there is actually a belief in the coming back, in the arrival of a Messiah, and so in the second coming of Jesus Christ. And, and for this reason, the initials of Rose Cross, uh, mean also resurrection of Christ. And I try to explain uh, that this uh, Rosicrucian manifesto that uh, was published in 2007 had some of the most credible and influential Freemasons at a worldwide level participating. And now this order is uh, striving, is going very well uh, amongst the elite. They meet in castles around Europe secretly. But if you actually read the, the manifesto, there is a point of the manifesto which is quite, you know, quite clear here. It says, our order teaches that true Christianity is not merely a question of belief, but also one of racial karma. After the invasion of the kingdom of Israel, the Assyrians scattered the indigenous population, they resettled in the Caucasus Mountains, and later drifted into Europe. We believe that the Anglo-Saxon and associated Indo-European cultures are the spiritual and literal descendants of these lost ten tribes of Israel representing God's chosen people, as mentioned in the Old Testament. We believe in the inevitability and the end of the end of the world and in the second coming of Christ. So this is the core belief of some of the leading world Freemasons, amongst them people like Robert Gilbert, um, people like uh, the Chicheros, uh, who have been very popular because they republished the work of uh, Israel Regardi, and, and so we are talking about some of the most important people at the worldwide level. Also, Masonically speaking, the guy who uh, is in charge of this order, I talk about them, though, more in the specifics in volume one, uh, which is called, I think, Michael Buckley. He basically uh, is a guy who uh, has, uh, I mean, one probably of, very influential Freemason. Let's say this. Mm -hmm. One of the most influential Freemasons in the United Genealogy of England, which, as you know, is a very important, uh, uh, probably is the central uh, obedience of Freemason because every lodge in the world to be regular has to be regularized under the United Genealogy of England. Now, this guy, Michael Buckley, who is the team leader of this project, uh, is also a member of Lloyd's Insurance Brokerage Company, so he has a, also a very high-profile job in the banking world. So these people are strong in, the, in whatever they're doing in their lodges, in the esoteric world, but they are also strong in the real world. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's, of course, here we're not talking only about uh, people like the Ordo Templi Orientis. Here we're talking about groups that are, e are even more elitarian. And that's why the Ordo Templi Orientis tried to infiltrate like I described in volume one, the Società Rosicruciana in Anglia. And all the details and the names and, and, and everything about, even the documents about this infiltration are in volume one. But still, as I said, I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, again, about this important manifesto of the modern Rosicrucians, because I think it really defines the, the importance of the times we are living. Mm -hmm. 
and, and that's why I myself, in the work that I'm doing, I know that, you see, we have been uh, now working uh, a few months ago with a team of true legends, with Timothy Alberino, who uh, came to Italy. He was sent by Stephen Quayle for a documentary called The Unholy Sea. This documentary is actually being released now. And I advise everybody to go and watch it because what you're going to see in this documentary is unseen and uh, pretty shocking. And actually, Timothy Alberino was attempted. His life was attempted. He, they tried to kill him after when he came. Uh, he was in the U.S. after he, he was actually starting to work on the documentary. Fortunately, this murder attempt didn't for him and his family, which you can find online. They talk about it. Uh, he talked about it publicly. And and so you should really check this uh, this documentary because uh, I don't know if you remember a few years ago I did a, an interview which was quite popular on the internet with Project Camelot. Yes, I do remember that. Okay, now in this uh, interview, at one point I talk about Zaccaria Sicin and Corrado Balducci. Okay, now I said certain things back then, but I couldn't bring you the evidence. Now this time I not only bring the evidence, I bring the person who was actually bringing the messages between Balducci and Zakaria Sitchin with the photos of him and Zakaria Sitchin. He actually used to bring all the secret documentation and stuff between the Vatican and Zakaria Sitchin. Okay, so what does that really mean about Zakaria Sitchin? Is he someone not to be trusted? Is he a Jesuit plant? No, no, no. It started actually, you have to see the documentary because I brought this guy called Gianmario Ferramonti, who is a member of one of the most elite lodges in Italy. I convinced him to give this interview. It was really hard to convince them, but in the end, I managed to convince them because I said, you know, I want people to really know the truth. And if I only say it, they will not believe me. But if, you, if, you know, the people come from America and they see that actually you, uh, this guy is one of the most known businessmen and politicians in Italy, say something like this, they will actually believe you. Right. So it's very important uh, that you watch this interview because uh, for the first time, Gianmario Ferramonti, who is a very known businessman in Italy in the 80s, he was one of the first people to bring uh, um, things like mini, like hard disk or things like, you know, from the new technology, uh, Amstrad computers. Uh, he was the first one. I mean, he made a lot of money. He, he was very respected, but he had a long lasting friendship with Zachariah Sitchin since the early 80s. Right. And, and for that reason, he uh, became the messenger between him and Corrado Balducci. And uh, re he re reveals uh, in this documentary certain things that people will finally say, well, actually, Leo was completely right in what he was saying. And, uh, you know, a lot of those people, I hope that for years have been maybe joking around with what I said. They were taking it a little bit more seriously now. And, 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 and that is a great satisfaction on my side. But there is also another thing. Here we're talking about the Vatican hiding what they're really doing in Mount Graham. Yes. Uh, we are talking about a new world order that is covering up the alien agenda because they are involved in it. Uh, last week in Europe, uh, Juncker, when he was actually replying to Nigel Farage after the Brexit, and you can go and check this on the Internet now, he actually mentioned other worlds. And to give people a little context about Mount Graham, this is where apparently... There's an entity that lives there. It's Native American Holy Land, and the Vatican wants to build an observatory there, correct? They already built it. It's operational. And actually, for the first time, we they actually managed, while I actually managed to go inside the headquarters of the Jesuits, and for a few minutes we managed to film there, they actually managed to go inside the Mount Graham Observatory, and they managed to also film something that is... I mean, unheard of. The guy admitted that in order to watch the skies for those planets which they are monitoring in that uh, observatory, the Lucifer Ob Observatory, they actually have to wait the UFOs to move away. Hmm. And he said this on camera. Wow. There's a lot going on. And uh, you know, to get into your book a little bit more, you mentioned that the real power traces back to the astral dimension above the power pyramid. Absolutely. That's something we've explored before, but elaborate on those claims a little bit. Who's really up there in the astral plane at the top apex of the pyramid? 
entities uh, that uh, can be tricksters, jinn, uh, other kind of spirits. Uh, we can also have angels, of course, but angels uh, don't really come in communication or even demons uh, uh, don't come in communication if they're not evoked in a certain way. Okay, mm -hmm. um, they, some of them also preside specific doorways to other dimensions, extra dimensional entities uh, uh, we're talking about uh, that, uh, of course, like I revealed in volume one, they get mistaken for uh, an alien kind of view of the alien uh, agenda, also the alien figure, because of the ignorance of us, of the people who are viewing them. One instead that we are talking here about uh, um, entities that have the possibility of uh, traveling extra dimensionally, so materializing in different dimensions. We don't have this kind of technology, at least that we know of, but in reality, there exists also this technology. Now, uh, in volume two, I talk very specifically about this great wall. I don't know if you uh, read uh, in my book about this eh? because mm -hmm. this great wall is falling down in the end of times that separates the cosmos the loco, the loca from the outer darkness, the aloca and basically it's like there is, um, it's like as parts of the walls are falling down and Gog and Malkog are coming in with their legions so the end times, the, it, it's actually this scenario, it's allowing the subsequent passage of the infernal legions into a reality. Now, people will like to know, so what caused all this? Now, a more specific uh, um, explanation of all this will be given also in the next book following volume three, which is called Invisible Master. But in the meantime, in volume two, I describe the influence of this astral dimension on our everyday lives. Who are these unknown superiors of Freemasonry or Martinism? Who are these uh, uh, invisible masters of Freemasonry, of the Rosicrucians? Um, I try to give an explanation that are, uh, first of all, at a historic level. Second of all, so, so I ex bring you directly into the core secrets of groups like the Golden Dawn, which based all their studies into Egyptian, Greek, and Hindu mythology, and of course, Jewish Kabbalah. And I tried also to explain the importance in all this of Theosophy and of Madame Blavatsky. Uh, Alistair Crowley, who, as you know, is uh, revered by many as one of the founders of modern Satanists, together with Anton LaVey later on, which probably founded something much more commercial, much more in line with what people perceive to be Satanism, but in any case, he used to praise himself to be born the year, the foundation of the Theosophical Society. So I wanted people to understand in this conspiracy why a lot of these members of these satanic cults, including Michael Aquino, which probably you have talked about before, mm -hmm. um, are actually followers of Theosophy. And neo-theosophy right. in particular, neo-theosophy is a branch of theosophy that sprang after the death of Madame Blavatsky when the Jesuit order took control of the whole thing and, and Christianized it and made it into different, Christianized in a kind of way. But I can say really that uh, uh, this, uh, this book here, for those uh, who want to find uh, some credible answers, uh, I think it, 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 it's a, it's a next level of wanting to go into the study of these subjects because otherwise we will always stay at a level of superficiality. We will always stay at the level in which, you know, you will be reading this book and the usual academic asshole will come up to you and say, oh, but this is all rubbish. Right. Now, with this kind of book where I actually bring inside documents, credible evidence, uh, sources which are actually much more grounded than just uh, uh, opinions or uh, speculations. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that this will change things uh, and will change also the approach that people have towards this whole worldwide conspiracy, which is very serious affair. And, and, and it's actually happening now in the U.S. with the American elections and which are like, unfortunately, Donald Trump uh, is he, he said these elections are completely rigged. He's completely right. I'm sorry to say that it will be very difficult to get 
Trump in the White House because unfortunately it's all rigged and Clinton is part of this establishment which has uh, is driving all the various strategies mm -hmm. like the Council of Foreign Relations, Soros, uh, who is also a great manipulator of the recent Ukraine crisis. Uh, And, and so I write also about this kind of thing in volume two. It's not just a book about esoteric knowledge. It's a book that every now and then also go, goes into the now, in what the Latins used to call ik et nunc. Now, so now, the now, mm -hmm. uh, living the now and especially describing the now. Yeah. Uh, in regards also to this book, there is a specific chapter which I think uh, will also be very important for even for academics who want to have a, a more serious perspective about um, the, uh, the initiatic use of drugs in secret societies belonging to the Illuminati network mm -hmm. and actually experimenting such drugs a long time before they experimented them in California and Rome in the 1920s. Right, right. Creating creating with Julius Sevola, with the group of war, with certain people, the roots for that psychedelia that was then forged upon, I believe, in some of their experimentations. Because some of those people involved in MK Ultra, involved in mind control, like Huxley, like but even the most recent, like Aquino, these people have studied the group of the UR, this group which I talk about, uh, uh, their experimentations with drugs and with the occult, And so I think that this, uh, also this chapter regarding Illuminati and, psych and psychedelia from Rome to California, it's uh, something uh, that probably a lot of people would like to read because at a cultural level, it actually gives you the possibility then to understand certain things and then studying them yourself, yourself more in depth. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, yeah. you will start studying uh, something that you found on a chapter or in another chapter because it suits you more. And, and that's good because then maybe you will elaborate your own book on that topic. I can only introduce you to that topic with 400 pages. But of course, if I had to write in detail of all these topics, then I will end up writing uh, thousands and thousands <laughs> and it would be impossible. Right, I right. actually had the problems because the initial versions that I had done in Italy were at times getting too long. So I started to edit them to a level where they are actually readable to the, the public that nowadays is getting this book on Amazon or at Barnes and Noble. And, and, and it's actually, I'm getting a, a lot of satisfactions through the fact that America is reacting very well to the publication of my confessions which give also the uh, listener, the viewer, the people who have seen me on the internet for so many years, a different perspective about Leo Zagami. Mm -hmm. They will not talk about if Leo Zagami, but it's, I bring you in front of the evidence. Sure. In volume two, I bring actually a document signed by Licio Gelli, which is nominating General Savoyo as his um, successor. And there is me at the foundation of the worship of, of the new lodge uh, Licio Gelli in Italy with the photo next to the honorary uh, most worship of grand director of ceremonies of the Grand Orient of Italy, Roberto Macri, a photo and a document also next to General Savoyo. This is a NATO general, four-star general. You're not, uh, you know, you can't fake these things. <laughs> right, <laughs> I mean, right, you can't. You can't. Fake. I'm with you, man. But you've told us plenty about the books, and I do hope people will go and check them out. But we do need to give them more details while they're here. Let's get into the meat. And I hoped you could tell us about the elite and the history of their use of magic. Because, of course, over time, if they're communicating with these entities, stronger relationships are going to form. Well, I know you've written about this, but talk to us about these specific entity and elite partnerships that we're dealing with. Okay, first of all, I want to tell you one thing. In volume two, I focus specifically on how to defend yourself psych psychically from these entities and from the sects that activate them in the satanic world, in the occult world, these adepts of Atlantis, if you want to call them this way. Psychic defense is more the subject of this specific book, more than actually giving you the name. So that's something I will do in Invisible Master. Because also in Invisible Master, there is some specific warnings. Because when you start uh, giving these names, it's very dangerous. Meaning that they actually have an effect in the immediate. Okay. okay. Well, without so the names, what, can you describe the relationships in more detail? Of course. Uh, what I do is uh, I describe the way the orders, uh, 
um, create an egregore, a form, a shape uh, of thought that then feeds into the entity that they have decided is their protector. Okay, mm -hmm. then it depends if this entity, of course, is, is, uh, uh, Belzebu, Lucifer, or, or, or Satan. This is different kind of entities, no? But you can have also some much more obscure ones, some demons that have, uh, that are not mentioned very often and that have even more power because maybe they have a specific kind of power because maybe they take care of the wind. Like, uh, you know, like you can have Pazuzu uh, or you can have another of these gods. Now, this is specifics about uh, um, the link between the bloodlines and the entities is very important. That's why in volume three, I start to describe in a very serious and profound way the actual link between the bloodlines of the Illuminati and these entities and At that point, I introduced this subject, which on, board, on the next book, in, Invisible Master, is actually the evocation of these entities, because then these entities can be evoked through certain rituals. This knowledge about evoking and opening doorways into other worlds, this is some of the most sacred knowledge of the uh, secret societies we define as the Illuminati. So I uh, have... Uh, I think that it's very important. For example, people know that in the Golden Dawn, for example, there was uh, a whole myth around the Invisible Master, the secret chiefs that uh, were behind the foundation of the secret society. But then further on, there is other uh, uh, much more profound evidence that brings actually these occultists in contact with these entities, these aliens, even Alistair Crowley with Horus or Parkrat with um, the fact that he wanted to uh, have the Aeon of Horus and he was totally dedicated to that Aeon. Other people are dedicated to a different entity. Michael Aquino is dedicated to Set, as we know. So he has brought Satanism to actually embrace their own pagan god, which is also known in ancient Egypt as Set. And, uh, but I wanted to, in this book, show how there is a link between uh, these anti-Christian and anti-Semitic visions and a specific form of Croelianity, which is a really satanic, even more satanic than the Ordo Templi Orientis Caliphate. And I talked for the first time about Roberto Negrini and the OETO FHL, because here in Italy, he uh, probably is uh, regarded as one of the most dangerous Satanists and was actually arrested three years ago for pedophilia. So, but he, in the meantime, for many years, he conducted one of the most occult lodges and dark lodges of the Illuminati. Um, I also wanted to, in this book, uh, um, talk about certain specific secret societies and their relation with the different kind of entities from the traditional Alistair Crowley kind of vision, of uh, which was Egyptian. Alistair Crowley, not many people know, also sent a guy called Dadaji to India to get initiated in all the ancient Hindu cults, Indian cults, And he then founded, in the end of the 70s, a black magic secret society that mixes uh, Crowleyanity, so all the Illuminati traditions that Crowley had gathered, into the most uh, ancient forms of witchcraft, black magic, uh, uh, that you can find in India. And I, I don't think ma many people know about this, so it was interesting to know. And I also uh, brought the date of the foundation, which I think was 1978, the, the actual manifesto of the foundation. And, and I think that this is uh, very interesting because it shows that the Illuminati network is not only one part of the world. It spreads all over the place because the entities, they don't limit themselves only in one part of the world. But one thing is for sure that entities can have a specific link to certain places and that certain secret societies like to use those places. Uh, for example, do you know about the Holy Mary of Medjugorje? Uh, yeah, but tell the listeners in case they haven't all heard it. In the 80s, early 80s, uh, late 70s, early 80s, I think it was the early 80s actually, uh, a group of young people, very young, started to see the Holy Mary in this place. Now, 
these uh, visions helped gathering a lot of interest around this place, uh, right at the time in which Yugoslavia was fractioning itself and was coming into a war between uh, the various ethnicities, including also the Islamic one. So some people, you know, I mean, it was particular the way the, the whole thing shaped up. But now the interesting thing is that Pope Francis is not recognizing anymore Medjugorje as legitimate. But there is a whole people that are following it. And in the last few years, the Satanists are starting to abduct people. And even a priest has disappeared because when this Holy Mary appears, the day after, usually somebody disappears in the woods around the Medjugorje. Mm. And they don't, they don't find them anymore. They disappear completely. Wow. And so the police has been uh, interviewed uh, not so long ago by Vanity Fair in Italy. Uh, and they said uh, that uh, they were not uh, happy about the situation, and, but they will not discuss it because they thought there was Satanists behind the whole thing. And so this has been officially now admitted that there is Satanists ab- around this whole thing. So this is interesting because it seems like there might be a very strong interest uh, always, uh, like there's been uh, for centuries, in holy places uh, that maybe are uh, recognized to be like Rome, you know, the holy ground of Christianity or these other places. At the same time, there's always an alter ego, another version of things, because also there is the dark side that wants to place themselves right there at the center of action and grab those people, sacrifice uh, uh, people and do these uh, gestures because they can then grow their secret society. They can feed their entity with this energy from the human sacrifices and so on. Mm-hmm. So I think that I gave you here the answer for what you were more or less searching. Sure. Another question was a lot. I do have a lot of guests who doubt that the elite are really using magic, but you write about what you call the nerve center for the New World Order being the United Nations building in New York. And you mentioned this room for meditation where it seems like that's where the New World Order occult direct their egregore. Yeah. And, you know, it's a dark, quiet room with an altar. Tell us a little bit about this kind of a creepy, esoteric place. Mm. <laughs> well, it's interesting because... Uh... And not many people will think the UN is also used for some kind of hocus pocus kind of thing. But in reality, in reality, what happened is that the UN is not only the, let's say, uh, logistics for this uh, organization that is trying to bring together the nations at, uh, you know, at the physical level, bring in peacekeepers and blah, blah, blah. No, the UN is also part of a project, which is the New World Order. And this is this, you know, this land, this building in New York that was, the land was actually donated by Rockefeller family. It's uh, the headquarters have um, this particular room. Now people say, but why is this particular room satanic or has uh, this kind of, uh, let's say, name for it? Well, You have to understand that uh, the way uh, the New World Order uh, is generated, the theosophical and then neo-theosophical branches, which were very prevalent in the Mondialists and in those Freemasons that put together this United Nations project, they were all secretly followers of the doctrines of theosophy and then neo-theosophy taken over, as I said earlier, by the Jesuits. Okay? Mm -hmm. So... Inside this uh, Lucifer Trust that then became Lucy's Trust, there is a lot of influence on uh, the UN and uh, what the UN then spiritually accepted. People think that maybe the UN uh, accepts uh, all different religions and so it's kind of democratic in the acceptance of the religions. Well, the thing is that at the same time, they as initiates of these secret societies, know very well that the religions are simply there to manipulate the population. And so they instead want to be protagonist of a religion uh, which is different, is a religion based on their own beliefs, on, uh, on, on their spiritual practices, which are, they don't have a belief in a particular God, but they feed into these gods with sacrifices, with with their acts, 
And at the same time, they're preparing for the coming of the Antichrist, this structure which uh, will, of course, uh, you be used to oppose then the Messiah. Now, there is a part of the United Nations, of course, uh, that thinks they are actually serving the future Messiah. And there is this whole story of the Matreya that comes into the equation, which was promoted initially within the realms of the Neo-Theosophical Society, and then later on became part of this uh, cult, which is very followed within the United Nations. That's why I said earlier, a lot of Satanists like Michael Aquino follow actually the neo-theosophy. And, uh, and, and, and you will be surprised how many people, and also the, the whole Ordo Tempi Orientis, Alistair Crowley uh, cult, uh, grow uh, within the realms of theosophy. So theosophy has a lot to do with this whole New World Order agenda. That's why I uh, kind of uh, um, worked on explaining why a lot in this specific book, because, uh, you know, you need a lot of books to go through the whole, uh, you know, explanation of what this new world order is. But in specific, theosophy is mixing a bit like a supermarket, like a typical, they are the creators of the new age term and of the new age philosophy because that's really who has crafted it. So you can see from New Age what kind of rubbish people believe. Uh, they, they, they kind of tend to bring mm -hmm. in various things uh, from various religions in a kind of sort of su supermarket of the religion where everything that fits their own needs and uh, b b without, of course, and losing, of course, their own roots the religion, whatever that may be, especially Christians, because the UN is deeply anti-Christian. And uh, the first uh, um, the first guy who became secretary of this uh, United Nations and actually created the room for meditation uh, was Doug Amarskjold. And this guy, Doug Amarskjold, uh, was uh, a Swedish diplomat, okay? particularly obsessed with Freemasonry and esoterism and the occult. So during his period as Secretary General of the United Nations, a position that he hold from 1953 to 1961, when suddenly his plane crashed and he died mysteriously. Hmm. He was the one who built it. Now we know in the Masonic tradition that the builder gets killed to then be resurrected. It's a symbology, but it's very important. In ancient Egypt, the people who used to build certain structures, especially in ancient Egypt, when you had the, uh, a lot of uh, people don't know, but human sacrifice was practiced in ancient Egypt. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and people were silenced and killed, so nobody could talk about it, but especially the builder who knew all the secrets, as we know, had to die together with the pharaoh. Now, uh, in uh, Scandinavia, this guy, this first uh, secretary uh, general of the United Nations was from uh, Sweden. Then the second one uh, that followed him, I think, was from Norway. You will not think that certain countries who are min minuscule countries have so much power to actually become heads of the United Nations. For the first, you know... Maybe one will imagine maybe an American to be the first Secretary General of the United Nations, no? But there is a reason here, because Doug Amershod, who actually died and was murdered, because after, the, in recent years, a um, Norwegian general came on and gave his confession about the fact that uh, he was alive when the plane fell down, where he actually fell down, and they actually found the murdered on the ground. Damn. So this is not just a speculation of mine. Mohammed Gheddafi, when he gave his historical speech at the United Nations, that probably cost his life, because after, as you know, the Libyan president was killed later on. Right. He actually talked about the fact that Doug Amashov had been killed and that this had to be investigated, this murder, just as the one of John F. Kennedy. And so this is very important for the New World Order uh, that you are trying to study and to also explain to your listeners, mm -hmm. because it explains that Muhammad Gaddafi had uh, questioned a couple of murders that uh, were not to be questioned, 
Okay. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, after doing that, uh, he, he ended up uh, with, uh, with being killed. And I, we know what happened later on. So his point is to, to go on on that. I mean, I talk about also the creation of ISIS by the military industrial complex in volume one of my confessions and also the lodges involved uh, with the Ator Pentalfa transnational lodge and always giving also my own uh, references on where I get this information and so it's uh, very credible because it's from an uh, ex-worship or master of one of the most important lodges in uh, in Rome. Right, it's all in the book, but wow man, the UN having a secret room for commanding egregores on the astral plane, Yeah, <laughs> that's not nothing, but we are getting to the halfway point here and I wanted to make sure we get some details in the first hour, so I'm going to read a passage from the book and see if you can give us a bit more on it, but you say, about this date, 2020, while you may think it's provocative of me to announce such a fixed date, from my point of view, the die is cast. And now, more than ever, we must prepare to live during these years of tribulation leading up to 2020. During this time, we will witness the choreography of a series of natural disasters, the spread of deadly viruses, unspecified events that will bring hunger and destruction, and a full-on World War III. These conclusions are not crackpot conspiracy theories. Instead, they are yet to be realized facts. Those are bold statements, man. Can you elaborate on any details there or target areas for these orchestrated events that you've been privy to so people can possibly prepare? I think that the veil of Maya has been lifted after 2012. 2012 was not the, you know, actually the key date for the Maya prophecy, but actually more for the effect of the veil of Maya being lifted. And veil of Maya is instead an Indian term, Indian in the sense of India, and, and it doesn't come from the the concept of the South America Maya. So, but uh, this 2012 started a process. Now, 2012 starts a process that ends up seven years later in 2019. 2020 becomes the turning point. It's not that in 2020 you will have uh, the, 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 the complete annihilation of the planet, but you will have the beginning of one of the greatest confrontations that this planet has ever seen because of the weapons that we have, I think that uh, because of the technology that they have been given to us and the way that we are using it, we can definitely see 2020 as the beginning of a turning point that might bring us to really manifesting those prophetic uh, 500 million uh, prophesied by the Georgia Guidestones. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very sad that not many people want to commit to understanding the importance of uh, what kind of time we are living in now. They think we are living in the same kind of time we were living 50, 40, 30 years ago when wars were actually being eradicated in the way that we have just finished the Second World War. There was a great moment for humanity of peace. This uh, moment, uh, unfortunately, is about to end abruptly, also in the West because uh, it's been uh, an end of two world wars, but mostly it's been the end of wars for the Western world. The Western world has not lived wars in their own territory any longer, okay? Mm -hmm. One instead, uh, what's uh, expecting in front of us from 2020 onwards is a return of those wars in the Western world, meaning Europe and the US. The civil unrest, the, the fact that we are... Uh, not being respected anymore democratically will ultimately lead the people to rebel. Um, you can rig the elections. You can maybe get Hillary Clinton to become the president, but this is not going to last, meaning that uh, you will start a process that will inevitably end up in civil war. At the same time, uh, we have uh, natural disasters which are provoked uh, with uh, very... Uh, very futuristic technology, but technology that exists is not just speculation. Uh, and, 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 and so this technology might be put uh, at use. It's very easy for them now with ultrasonic uh, weapons to make explosions. Uh, in 60 minutes, they can reach any part of the world. Mm -hmm. with the, the new ultrasonic technology. And at the same time, they can create earthquakes in any part of the world. 
with explosions, with other kind of techniques. Uh, and, and so I wanted to also talk about the Princess Karo Nakamaru and what she said as a Japanese about what happened in Japan, uh, Fukushima, uh, the whole event that changed the life of Japanese, but also an event that is part of this uh, transformation of this uh, scenario of revelation. It's not just... Uh, Something that we are not, uh, you know, we are about to, here we are living it in the now, the invasion of the Muslim world here in Europe and the terrorist attacks is just the beginning. We are being invaded. There is a war going on and this war soon is going to be in front of our house. It's not going to be anymore on the other side of the world. Mm. If we realize this, then at that point, maybe we should stop a moment before it's too late and change things. Unfortunately, the majority of people, because they don't want to stop, they want to just think like they're living the 6th, the 7th, the 5th. Oh, no, they're just not living the now. They're living in another world. Most of them are anchored to certainties that soon, even in the banking system, might bring to an abrupt change. Mm. So we have to understand uh, how how the world is moving and counteract by being less reliable on certain things that this modern society gives for granted, including electricity, including oil, including all the rest. Mm. Last thing I want to ask you before we go, um, knowing that the Illuminati or knowing that the New World Order like their coded dates and numbers, are there certain dates we should keep an eye out for coming up to 2020 where we should be extra careful? I think that uh, you know now, by now, that uh, the Illuminati give a lot of importance to the number 11. So 11 is always be going to be a key number in their uh, in their uh, rituals, in their equations, in their evil equations at times. But nowadays, uh, I would say that the Illuminati are working on a series of numbers that will continue repeating themselves growingly, more and more repeating in front of our eyes, and making more evident uh, the nature of the beast uh, through what is happening. Uh, we are, uh, for, for when in the 80s we saw an Oprah Winfrey uh, appearing, Michael Aquino saying, uh, We are not servants of some god, declaring we are our own gods. That was where uh, Oprah Winfrey and the New Age uh, was opening up, uh, even if they did it unwillingly, just by guessing a Satanist like Michael Aquino, to a very dangerous path, because man can't be their own God. Mm -hmm. Without uh, uh, this uh, understanding that there is superior forms of existence uh, and that they might come in to help us only if we are modest enough to have a pure heart and accept their help, but uh, without uh, conditions, then maybe we can work something out. We are not alone in the universe. There is not only evil in the universe. There is also good. But we have to then respect that uh, and change our vibration. That change of vibration will mean not eating any more animals. It will mean uh, changing the vibration. Mm -hmm. it will, it, it, it's, it's not, it's a question of changing our vibrations to changing ourselves as a species because we are going the wrong way. And so gradually we might, but this doesn't mean that we can't kill an animal and eat him. That doesn't mean that. It means that we can't let a bunch of people grow and kill animals in the way they are doing because it's completely outrageous for Inhabitants of other parts of the universe, this concept is unequivocally wrong. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and so that's why we have to really evolve the, as a species before we can make uh, evolution uh, happening. And I uh, thank you very much for having me on your show. I hope uh, that your listeners uh, will uh, now appreciate even more reading this book, Confessions of an Illuminati, Volume 2 on CCC Publishing. Absolutely. And just uh, remind them where, about your website and anything else you might have going on before we really close it out. Yes, my website is uh, leozagami.com, but for my books, uh, cccpublishing.com uh, is uh, instead the website of my publisher based in San Francisco, which is making an excellent work into bringing you these books in the English language. Uh, and I think that now that people are starting to reading these books, they will also change their 
superficial perspective about uh, Leo Zagami's adventures. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, thanks so much, man. It's been a real pleasure. Be careful out there. I hear it's going to be a rough four years. It's a rough uh, four years, but it's not that I have uh, an easy an easy 20 before <laughs> i come from a very rough uh, uh, few years before so i'm i've been ready and getting ready for it uh, for a long time and that's uh, why uh, we should never give for certain all the things that we have around us uh, and we have to thank for them every day the almighty lord thank you very much and god bless america <laughs> right on man cheers take care take care there we go higher side chatters you know I do have a lot of respect for Leo. I like the details and the density of his writing, but it did take us almost the whole first hour to really get into those details rather than just references to other forms of media. But that's why it's always good to have some deep quotes on hand because that's usually what jumpstarts the mind of a guest who's probably got so much going on up in their head, it can be a bit overwhelming. This is dense material. But you can tell from those quotes, he really does get into some wild stuff. And as much as religion isn't really my bag, I do think there are elements of orchestrated prophecy manifestation among the agendas of the elite, which always seemed weird to me when a prophecy is written about thousands of years ago, and you have so much power that you could just make a war happen where they might prophesize a war, or you can put environmental disaster where they might mention that type of turmoil, is it really prophecy at that point? I guess it really only matters that it does happen, not how it happens or who predicted it might happen or if that person who put it into motion had previous knowledge. I guess none of that really matters if the actual event takes place. It's a weird thing, but maybe we think about prophecy all wrong. Maybe the entity that might have delivered a particular prophecy to whomever knew that if they just made a decree, eventually humans would make it happen once the idea was out there. Like there's just something about humanity that's attracted to making predictions work out, like moths to a flame. I also might not know what I'm talking about either. Let's not rule that out. But if you were intrigued by some of the things Leo had to say, the second hour, we really did get way deeper into it with things like why Sirius is so important to the elite and the Vatican, the reptilian connection, the importance of extra dimensionality the underground tunnel system set up by the fallen angels before the flood, the entities inside the earth, extra-dimensional gateways opening at CERN, the difference in magic between the eastern elite and the western, and several other things. I think we covered some great stuff, and I definitely think Leo is knowledgeable. And I know that there will be listeners that are skeptical of his family connections and elite circles. That's legitimate. You should be curious about that. The elite have many deceptions, and obviously even Leo would admit that, but he does put it all out there on the table. So at least you know where he's coming from, and you can account for that stuff however you decide to. But Magic in the Elite has got to be one of my top three topics to cover, and I hope there were a few revelations or things that stuck with you. I know the quote-unquote meditation room at the UN headquarters and the entity that resides at the top of Mount Graham that the Native Americans were trying to protect I find that stuff all to be pretty amazing. So I'm glad we could swim around in that deep end of the pool at least a bit. Only wish it could have been more. Again, big thanks to Leo for taking the time, and I'll see you guys next week. Your move sorcerers of the New World Order and the egregores that serve them, your fucking move. No one knows what it's like to be the bad man, to be the sad man. Behind blue eyes And no one knows what it's like To be hated To be faded To telling only lies But my dreams Aren't as empty As my car I have hours only lonely since they exposed me on THC. Mm -hmm. No one knows what it's like to 
feel these feelings like I do, and I blame you. No one bites back as hard on their anger. None of my pain and woe can show through. But my dreams aren't as empty as my conscience seems to be. I have hours always lonely since they exposed me on THC. Thanks for listening to the first hour of the Higher Side Chats podcast with me, Greg Carlwood. If you don't know, there is a second hour to all the episodes we do around here. Generally, we're able to get a lot deeper into the topics and ideas that a guest is about. So if you enjoyed what you've heard from THC for free, consider signing up at thehiresidechatsplus.com to get the second hour of the five shows I put together each month. I never really wanted to be a paid subscriber podcast, but I really hate the idea of spending airtime promoting some product that's completely unrelated and telling you the best way to support the show is to buy an audiobook or new underwear by mail or something crazy like that. So instead, if you like the show, double your time with it for five bucks a month and let's cut out all the other shit. It's half the price of a movie ticket and you get at least an extra five hours of show a month. Collectively, it keeps us stable and it frees me from wasting your time with anything but the show you came to listen to. It's really the only way for an independent one-man show to make it, and I do what I can so that it's worth your while. Since we started this, I've always tried to use the subscriptions to improve the podcast and make signups more advantageous. It started with just a second hour for the main show, but now we've got a nice forum going where people can get deeper in conversation about the episodes with other listeners submit a candidate in the guest request thread, or share their own personal projects to get out of the soul-crushing 9-to-5 cog-in-the-wheel life on the entrepreneur's thread. The forum and the plus comments are always the first places I try to go for listener engagement, but it does get harder as the show gets more popular. Because of that, there's also a direct messaging feature that you can use to reach me through the plus site also. But beyond the form, if you like any of the music I've used for THC, most of it I've hired artists to make, and I provide it all as free downloads to Plus members too. So if you like a particular song you've heard close the show out recently, come get the MP3. I should also mention that if you don't like the idea of paying $5 recurring every month, I get that. You can buy three months, six months, or a year up front and just be done with it. I have plenty of listeners who send checks and money orders to the P.O. Box too, I try to make it as easy for people as I can, and you can read more about it on the sign-up page. Also, be sure to check out the FAQ help page on the Plus site if you have any questions or concerns about how to listen to a password-protected show on your devices. I've highlighted a lot of great solutions, and one of those would be the iPhone app that just recently hit the Apple App Store. 
A super kind and talented listener made it for us, and you can use it to stream or download either the free or the plus show. If you're on Android, I'd use Pocket Casts or Podcast Addict and subscribe to the feed manually that way. I also try to throw in occasional bonus shows or Q&A shows, and I've got a few other weird ideas I might get to try out soon. But I give you all I can for five bucks, and I hope you'll at least give it a shot if you've listened to a few free shows and you find them unique or valuable. I know there's a lot of podcasts out there, and I'm just one of them. But if you have any questions, concerns, or comments about any of this, please get in touch with us at the Higher Side Chats team at gmail.com. I also wanted to plug the Higher Side newsletter I'm going to be putting out, totally free for anyone who wants to sign up at the main internet website for the show, thehiresidechats.com. You can also get on that email list through the Higher Side Chats Facebook page. There's a button there as well. But the reason I'm doing this is because I get tons and tons of emails after a show goes up asking me about how I feel about a particular guest or topic, and the wrap-up isn't always the best place to do that, especially if I have anything negative to say. Sometimes the dust needs to settle. Sometimes I need to hear feedback from you guys first. There are a lot of factors, but I usually have something to communicate to you, and I just don't get to do it. So on the first of the month, I plan to send out a little newsletter with my thoughts about the five shows the previous month and talk to you about anything else that's on my mind or that's going on. And what's probably most enticing is that I'm going to give you some insight into at least one guest I have coming up in the month, which people have been begging for some posted schedule for a long time. I personally think I'd like the surprise. But sign up for the Higher Side newsletter. It's free. It comes out on the first of the month, and I won't waste your time with any other emails. And that's it. I appreciate you listening. I try to give alternative ideas and guests a fair shake on a high-quality podcast, expose some deep-level conspiracies without the yelling, and I hope to offer some inspiration that even though the system relentlessly suggests you should follow their blueprint to mediocrity, you can do your own thing and live a much happier life despite all the negativity in the world. So go ahead and treat yourself. Isn't it about time? <laughs>